which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because that in it he had rested from all his work which God created and made. Let me ask you this question. We just read about the seventh day. What did God commemorate on the seventh day? That means, what did God on the seventh day, he said, let us now recognize a special creation that was finished. What creation was God recognizing as good, as perfect, as complete, when he rested on the seventh day? What was finished? The creation. The creation was finished. The birds, the little fishies, they were all happy, swimming around and singing and flying. Everyone was having a good old time in the Garden of Eden. It was good. It was very good. And on the seventh day, God did no work. He rested and He says, this is a special day. He sanctified it. That means He set it apart separate from the rest of the days, and God says, on this day I rest, and I, and I reflect upon the creation that I made. Can anyone tell me, in these verses that we read, that God tells Adam to rest on the seventh day? We read verses 1 through 3. Does anyone find in those verses where God tells Adam or Adam's children that they need to rest on the seventh day. Verse 3. God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because that in it he had rested from all his work which God created and made. So where does God tell Adam, Adam I want you to rest every seventh day. It's not in there. He doesn't say it. It says God rested. It doesn't say that God told Adam to rest. So, did God institute, did God begin here, the seventh day Sabbath? No. The word Sabbath is not found in these verses. The word Sabbath means rest. So you can say God Sabbath, or God rested on that day, and it was a special day. But nowhere does it say that God told Adam, or his children, or grandchildren, that they should rest on the seventh day. There's no Sabbath commandment here. So when Adam was created and he's naming the animals, he gets lonely, he has Eve, they have kids, Adam and Eve get old and those kids get old, Adam and Eve die, their kids die. Do we find any mention of a commandment that God says, I want you to rest on the seventh day? Do we have any kind of record where where Noah kept the Sabbath. There's none. What about uh, Enoch? He walked with God. No, no record of Enoch keeping the Sabbath day. What about Adam? Did he ever rest on the seventh day? Do we have any kind of writing about that in the Bible? No. There's nothing in the Bible that tells us that God said to rest on the seventh day until... We come all the way to Exodus chapter 20. So let's turn there in Exodus chapter 20. So the question is, when did the Sabbath begin? When did the Sabbath begin? The seventh day Sabbath. Now the word Sabbath, again, it means rest. And there are different rests in the Bible. There are different Sabbath Sabbaths among the Sabbath in the Bible. So we have the seventh day Sabbath, that's every week, and then there's special Sabbaths among the Sabbath as well. Like before Passover, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the Feast of Tabernacles, there were times where God said, I don't want you to do any work, I want you to rest on these days and, and worship me, and have a holy convocation, a holy coming together, a service. So, we see that on the seventh day Sabbath, where was it commanded, when was the first command given in the Bible that man was to rest on the seventh day? Not until Exodus chapter 20, verse 
number seven. I'm sorry, in Exodus chapter 20, verse number eight, it says, Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Holy means sanctified. Holy means separate, set apart. So if it's holy unto the Lord, that means it's separate unto the Lord. If it's set apart unto Rao, that means it's separate unto Rao. So we could say, Rao, is that your Bible? Okay, that is holy to Rao. That means it is set apart to Rao. This is my Bible. It's separate to me. It's holy. It's separate to me. If it's food or drink or a cup, that can be holy. It can be sanctified, but not to the Lord. Here, the seventh day was sanctified, given to the Lord. That's the seventh day. And in, in the Ten Commandments, Exodus chapter 20, it says that God put His claim upon the seventh day. He said, I want you to remember the seventh day and to keep it holy. But I guarantee you, every single one of you here today did not remember the seventh day and kept it holy. We did not remember the seventh day. And so some people, they will say, well, how dare you break one of the Ten Commandments? Don't you know that God gave the seventh day and He said to remember it, and so you have forgotten it, and so you're sinning by forgetting the seventh day? That's what they'll say. So let's look a little bit deeper at what is going on here. When did the Sabbath begin? When did the seventh day Sabbath begin? What's that? Yeah, the Saturday of rest, the seventh day Sabbath, where God commands people. When did God command people to rest? Yes, in Exodus chapter 20, during the giving of the Ten Commandments on Mount Horeb, and who was it that God gave those commandments to? He gave it to Moses. He said, Moses, I want you to go down this mountain and I want you to give these commandments to the children of Israel. If we look, and so Moses did. He comes down and he hears some strange music and he sees the children of Israel listening to rock music, dancing, committing fornication and idolatry. And Moses says, you bad, dirty little children of Israel. How dare you do something like this? And he took the Ten Commandments that God had written with his finger and he smashed them on the ground and broke them in his anger. Moses had a little bit of a temper tantrum. And then he had to go back up the mountain and this time he had to make the Ten Commandments himself. God wasn't going to make it this time. It was kind of like a punishment. God said, well Moses, you destroyed the first one I gave you. I'm going to make you make the second copy yourself. So Moses made those. So. He went down and he told the children of Israel, Hey guys, I have these new commandments from God. And some of them they already knew, like, Thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not lie, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not covet. We, they already knew those. Those were not new. But there was one commandment of those ten that was new. They didn't know what to do. They did not know how to follow it. And that was the seventh day. I mean, there's a story in Numbers chapter 15. You don't have to turn there. But um, in Numbers 15, it says that the children of Israel, um, after Moses had given them the Ten Commandments, there was an Egyptian in their midst. And he went out and he started gathering sticks um, on the Sabbath day. Numbers 15, 32 says... And while the children of Israel were in the wilderness, they found a man that gathered sticks upon the Sabbath day. And they that found him gathering sticks brought him unto Moses and Aaron and unto all the congregation, and they put him in ward, that means in jail, because it was not declared what should be done to him. So they found this guy, this Egyptian, breaking the Sabbath day, and they said, hey, you, you're breaking the Sabbath day. And for that, you need to be, you need, for that, you need to be, wait a minute, they don't know. This is a new commandment. This is a new thing to them. Now, if it was murder or lying or stealing, they know what to do. They've known how to do that since creation. But breaking this new commandment, this new thing, this new thing called the Sabbath, they had no idea. 
So they put the guy in jail, they went to Moses and Aaron, and they said, Moses and Aaron, we got this guy, he's breaking the Sabbath. What are we supposed to do? And Moses and Aaron said, we don't know, it's a brand new thing. It's not something we've ever done before. It's not something Noah ever did before, or Adam, or Enoch, or Seth, or Lamech, or Abraham, or Isaac, or Jacob, or Joseph. I don't know, Moses said. I need to go ask God. And so Moses goes to God. My point is this. If the Sabbath had been around since creation, and man was keeping the, cap, the Sabbath commandment since creation, then why all this confusion? And why is it that it was never put in the Bible where God told man to keep the Sabbath until this time? Why not back in the Garden of Eden? And why is it with the, all the sins that man were committing? Murder like Cain and polygamy and the sins that were mentioned before this time. Why is it that God never once said, Oh, this guy over here did wrong because he broke the Sabbath. Not once. Why? Why do you think that God never got angry or mentioned anyone as having sinned by breaking the Sabbath until Exodus chapter 20? Why do you think that's the case? I'm testing you to see if you understand the point. Hmm. See, some of you thinking, and some of you are just completely lost. Why do you think that from Genesis chapter 1 verse 1 until Exodus chapter 20 verse 8 not one person was ever condemned by God for breaking the Sabbath. We find murder, we find drunkenness, we find fornication, we find adultery, we find stealing, we find coveting, we find pride, we find selfishness, we find envy. We find all of these sins, idolatry. But we don't find even one case where God was angry at anybody for breaking the Sabbath. Until after Exodus chapter 20. Why not? Uh, someone brave out there. What? Hey, so RJ is brave. Not correct, but he's brave. Hey, the Seventh day is holy, but why did God never get angry with anyone for breaking the seventh day Sabbath. After Exodus chapter 20, yeah. Guess what? That guy that was kindling, that was picking up sticks on the Sabbath, the Sabbath, guess what they did to him? Right? He died. They did not know what to do until then. So why is it that of all the sins that are mentioned from Genesis 1-1 until Exodus 20, not one time was God ever angry with anyone for breaking the seventh day Sabbath. Not even yet. Boom! Uh -huh. Because it did not exist. It did not exist. It's like, for example, also in Exodus chapter 20, it says, when you make an altar, don't use chiseled rock, use only naturally formed rocks. So if Abraham made an altar and he used chiseled rocks, he does not know about that commandment. It did not exist yet. Other things in the law, for example, do not use clothing made out of mixed garments. If it's cotton, it must be 100%. If it's wool, it must be 100%. If it's flax, it must be 100%. You're not allowed to mix half wool, half flax, 50% this, 50% that. That was Baal, according to the law. But that law did not start until the book of Exodus. So if Abraham walks around in a tunic and half of it was cotton and half of it was wool, no harm, no foul, because the law had not been invented yet. It was not established yet. There was no seventh day Sabbath commandment until Exodus chapter 20. So what does that tell us? It tells us that the Sabbath keeping is part of the ceremonial law. So what is the ceremonial law? There's two laws in the Old Testament. <coughs> Some of them are gone. They went bye-bye. When Jesus came, 
He died on the cross. He fulfilled the ceremonial law. Galatians chapter 3 says that the law is our schoolmaster that brings us to Christ. So in other words, the purpose of the ceremonial law was to point to Jesus Christ. So in other words, if you were uh, a Jew and you lived in the time of the law, say you were, you know, during the time of Moses or Daniel, and you're there alive and you try to keep the law, you try to keep the law, you're trying to keep the law, guess what? You're never going to keep the law. There was only one man who ever kept the law perfectly, and he never violated the law, not one time. Who, what do you think that man's name was? It was Jesus. It wasn't Moses. It wasn't Daniel. It wasn't Joseph. It wasn't anyone else. Jesus kept the law perfectly. So why did God make a law so hard, so difficult, that not even one person ever was able to keep the law perfect? Why? Because that was the schoolmaster. That was the teacher. So people would say, I'm trying to keep the law, but I can't do it. I'm trying to keep the law, but I can't do it. And that was the point. That the law was so hard to keep that people would surrender and give up and say, what must I do to be saved? I cannot do it by keeping the law. And that's why the law says, go to the Messiah that is going to come in the future. That was the point of the law. It was a an arrow. You ever see like in the cartoons, there's an arrow, right? And it's neon and it's blinking lights, you know, this way, this way, this way. That's what the law was. And guess where it was pointing? It was pointing to Jesus Christ. That was the purpose of the schoolmaster. Paul says, but we are no longer under the schoolmaster. That means we are not anymore under the law. The law was a shadow of Jesus Christ who was to come. So you could say, today in the year 2018, where do we look to learn about Christ? Do we look back to the law? Here's Christ in the year you know, 33 AD, dying on the cross. Here's us today. This is the timeline. Okay. Here's us today in 2018. And here's the law going like this, pointing to Jesus Christ. If uh, Len is here in 2018, where are you going to look back? Are you going to look back to the law? Or are you going to look back to Jesus Christ? Which one, Mitch? Always, you say Jesus Christ, you're always going to be right, okay? Always got the right answer. If that doesn't work, then you say God. If that doesn't work, you say the Bible. And then you got the answer. Right, so would it be silly, would it be silly for us to ignore Jesus Christ and go and study the law? Would that be silly? Yeah. Why would I study something that points to Jesus Christ when I already could study the man himself, Jesus Christ. Does the law tell us the name of the Messiah? No. But what was the Messiah's name? Mitch? Good. Jesus Christ. The law doesn't tell us that, but I know the name of the Messiah. It's Jesus. Does the law tell us the year that he would be born? No, but I know the year that he would be born. Because I know who that man is. Does the law tell us how he would die? No, it doesn't say he's going to die on the cross. Does the law tell us who his mother would be? No. Who his stepfather would be? No. Who his 12 closest friends would be? No, no, and no. We don't need to go to the law to learn about Christ. We can go to Christ to learn about Christ. So the problem with seven-day law-keeping is people want to hold on to the law and they forget about Christ. How silly is that? We don't need the law anymore to teach us about Christ. We have Christ. The ceremonial law was the part of the law that pointed us to Christ. We don't need it anymore. If you want to go eat pork, eat pork. If you want to go drink Didikuan, drink it up. Get up all of your face. 
blood gushing down your face, your chin filled with blood, and you're going like this blood all over your sleeve. Uh, go ahead, go do it. Elijah, you can go out and find a wild animal, and you and Pastor, your brother, can kill it and just get his bone and just start eating its kidneys, its liver, and just the blood. Go ahead, it's fine. Because the only blood that we need to do have anything to do with is not the blood of animals, of bulls, or of goats, or sheep. It's the blood of Jesus Christ. So I'm not going to try and teach you something by the blood of an animal. I'm going to show you to the blood of Jesus Christ. We don't need the ceremonial law anymore. If you want to wear your shirt and 50% is cotton and 50% is flax, that's fine. You can do that. Because that ceremonial law was pointing us to Jesus Christ. Does that mean that all of the entire Old Testament is now void? Does that mean we can take the Old Testament and just tear it out and throw it? No, because also there is the moral law. The moral law is something that began with Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. And it will continue through all of eternity. Can anyone tell me a moral law? Thou shalt not kill. The Hebrew word there is actually murder. Okay, to kill if you're a judge or a soldier. If you're not a judge or soldier, don't be killing people. It's not nice. Not nice. Thou shalt not kill. That's in the Old Testament. Should is it okay to kill now that we're done with the Old Testament and Jesus Christ has fulfilled the law? Of course, you still cannot kill. So that a moral law is something that you know to be true without even needing to read about it in the Bible. For example, Lapo Lapo. I know you guys don't, I know you guys love Lapo Lapo. I don't like Lapo Lapo. He should have just left poor Magellan alone. Let him sail around the earth if he wants to. Leave the poor guy alone. So Lapo Lapo, he kills Magellan. Think about those people in the Philippine Islands in the days of Lapo Lapo. Did they know that it was wrong to commit murder? Yes, they did. They did. Did they know that it was wrong to steal? Yeah, to lie. Yeah, they knew all those things. Covet. They knew those things. It was written on the tables of their heart. It's a moral law. They know it without having to turn to Exodus chapter 20 to find it out. Did they know that the seventh day was supposed to be a rest day? So when Magellan sails to the Philippines, he gets there on a Saturday, and there's Lapo Lapo in his hammock. He's just swinging back and forth in his hammock. Hey, Magellan, rest day. Kill you tomorrow. No, they don't know that the seventh day is the rest day. Because it's a ceremonial thing you have to be taught. But a moral law is something that you know just by being born. Okay? So I'm going to give you a little test. And let's see if you know the difference between moral and ceremonial. Okay? Uh, the law that says that you cannot combine a donkey, and yes, this is in the Bible, it's in the Old Testament, this is a law, I'm not making this up. The law that says you cannot mix a donkey with an ox to plow your field. It either has to be ox with ox, donkey with donkey, but the law says you cannot mix ox with a donkey to plow your field. Is that moral law or ceremonial law? It's ceremonial. No one would know that's a sin, not just inconvenient and wrong, but a sin unless someone actually told them that. That's how we know it's ceremonial. Alright, number two. Um... When you, when they were building the temple, okay, when they were building the temple, they were not allowed to bring in a hammer and a chisel. They were not allowed to do that. God said, if you want to chisel a block or a rock or whatever, you need to do it outside and then you transport it in. So during the construction of the temple, it was silent inside the building. Is that moral or ceremonial? It's ceremonial. Because how are you going to know that just by being born? You don't 
become born and then you turn 10 years old and you think, huh, sure would be wrong for me to build a temple and to take a rock inside and chisel that rock inside the work site of the temple. Sure would be wrong. No, you don't think like that. That's something that you would have to read to learn because it's ceremonial. What about this? Let's say you have a crush on your neighbor's wife. Moral or ceremonial? That's moral. You know you don't go down that road. You don't need someone to tell you to read Exodus chapter 20 to know you don't go down that road. You know you don't go down that road. Why? Because it's written on the table of your heart. It's a moral commandment. So the difference between a moral and ceremonial commandment is that one you don't automatically. When do Muslims, when do they worship? You know? What day do they pick to worship? They pick Fridays. Friday at noon, Muslims across the world will go and they will celebrate and worship their God, Allah. So it's not like it's the seventh day Sabbath is written on our hearts. Muslims pick Friday, that's the sixth day. God chose the seventh day to commemorate in remembrance of God chose the seventh day in commemoration or in remembrance to celebrate the creation. Someone said it. Good. And so that's what the seventh day is for. Okay? Muslims pick sixth day, now Christians do first day, and then the Jews before the seventh day. There's nothing moral about the certain day of the week. It is a ceremonial thing. Okay? What is a greater creation. The creation of your salvation or the creation of the earth, the birds and the trees. What creation do you think is better? To me, hands down, easily, is the creation of my salvation. And when was the creation, the victory of my salvation, when was it discovered and shown to the world? Close. And then after he was crucified, what happened? Yes, he conquered the grave. Remember that Sunday morning? Sunday morning. Where are we worshiping right now on a Sunday morning? Remember the Sunday morning when Magdalene, Mary Magdalene, while it was yet dark, she came unto the sepulcher. And then the stone was rolled away and Peter and John came in. And what did they find? Something that blew their mind. An empty tomb. An empty tomb. Our salvation, victory, Christ conquered death and the grave over sin. The promise had been fulfilled. The creation, a, a new creation had been established. What was that? The final creation of our salvation. Mankind had been redeemed. Amen. Humanity had been bought back. And we worship on Sunday. Not in commemoration of the creation of the birds and the mushrooms. We look back and commemorate, we remember, we celebrate the victory that Christ had over the grave. The creation of our salvation that we have. How silly, how crazy would it be if I were to say, you know Jesus, thank you for saving me. Thank you for that victory you had on the first day of the week. But, isn't it great that you created the oceans and the mountains and the stars? What good does that creation do me if I die and spend eternity in the lake of fire? That does not do me any good. The creation that I get excited about, the creation that I celebrate and am celebrating right now today, with you, my fellow believers in Jesus Christ, is the creation that we discovered on a Sunday morning. Can you think of any verse in the New Testament? Bible scholars, eyes up here. Can you think of any verse in the New Testament where Paul or John or Luke or James or Peter, when they're writing all of their New Testament books, can you think of one time where even one of those authors 
chastised someone. <laughs> thinking, I'm thinking the wheels are turning, spinning pretty fast. Not once. Not once. We learn about a man living with a stepmother. We learn about a, a guy who is a sorcerer. We learn about demoniacs. We learn about people who, who, who are weak in their faith. We learn about every kind of crazy sin in the New Testament. Over and over and over and over, they just like, especially Peter and these guys, just churning out all of these things. But never once does even one apostle ever get upset because someone broke the Sabbath. I wonder why that is. Now think about all of the lists, my list in the New Testament. I hate in English where you say S T S. You can't say list. So I'm just say my list. Think of all the my list in the New Testament, where it says, talks about you know the abominable and fearful and the sorcerers and idolaters in Revelation chapter 20. Or think of the one, the list, and where it says, uh, they shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Think of all of them on the list in the New Testament where it mentions the different types of sinful people. And can you think of anyone in any of those on the list where it talks about someone being a Sabbath breaker? There's not one. There's not one person who got in trouble for breaking the Sabbath in the New Testament. There's not one list of sinners in the New Testament, and there's a lot of those things, a lot of those on the list, with a lot of those people. And not one of them is ever condemned or chastised because of Sabbath breaking. Not one. If that was really something we should be keeping now, that would show up in all of those lists. But it doesn't. Because the Sabbath has been, was a part of the ceremonial law that what? Pointed us to Christ. The seventh day looks back on the week we just finished. We reflect upon the week that we just had. That's what we do on the seventh day. We're looking back. Or, you know, we, we, or we're looking forward. Seventh day, we're looking forward. We just finished the week. We're looking forward to the next week. And then the first day of the week, we're looking back to the previous week, reflecting on what we've done. As in the Old Testament, it looks forward to Christ. In the New Testament, we look back to Christ. Colossians 2.16. Sorry, I, do, I had it in my brain somewhere. I had to go delete a whole bunch of files just now to get to the right one. Uh, Colossians chapter 2. Verse number... Well, let's begin with verse number 14. Blotting out. That means taking a pencil and crossing it out. Blotting out. The handwriting of ordinances that was against us. That was contrary to us. And took us out of the way. And what does it say there? The next word. Nailing it to the cross. Nailing it to his cross. So in other words, Paul says there were some things that are, are hurting us. This is taking us out of the way. But now we can take a marker and we can blot it out. We can take an ink and we can ink it out. And we can take it and we can nail it to the cross. In other words, when Christ was nailed to the cross... So also was the ceremonial laws also nailed to the cross, and they are done, and they are gone, and they flew away like a little bird, flies away from its nest, and it's gone. It's, we're, we're not to be led by it anymore. It says, verse 15, And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. So what did Jesus Christ triumph? over when he was nailed to the cross, he triumphed over the law. He triumphed over the rules that had been burdensome upon mankind. Then verse number 16, this is the key point. Let no man therefore judge you in meat. Remember we talked about you couldn't eat pork. You could not eat an unclean animal. And what does Paul come and do? Paul comes and he says, don't let anyone judge you in meat. In other words, if you want to eat pork, go eat pork. If you want to be gross, go drink blood. That's just gross. But you can do it if you want to. You want to eat a steak? You want to eat a cockroach? Go ahead. Baluk, go ahead. Do it. Knock your brains out. Let no man therefore judge you in meat. So whatever food you want to eat, eat it. 
It says or in drink. This doesn't say that you can drink alcohol, but there are all kinds of rules about how much you can drink, when you can drink. Jesus Christ says, do you want to drink? Grape juice, drink grape juice. On the Sabbath, you want to make it? Go ahead. You want to drink water now? Go ahead. If you want to drink without washing your hands, go ahead. Drink without washing your hands. If you want to get germs? Go ahead. Put germs in your water. Drink the germs if you want to. Don't let anyone judge you in meat or in drink. Or in respect of a holy day. They had so many they had different feasts. Like Passover and Feast of Tabernacles and Feast of Unleavened Bread. A whole bunch of them that I'm forgetting. Why? Because it's not a big deal. I'm not under those anymore. It says, or of the new moon. You might know this already that the Jews do not keep the solar calendar. They keep a lunar calendar. That means we today, we follow the sun. 365 days, every four years, 366 days. The Jews don't. They have 12 months according to the lunar cycles of the moon. And some years they have 13 months to make up for it. So, here, Paul is saying, don't let anyone, if you want to keep a solar calendar, a lunar calendar, if you want to make your own calendar, knock yourself out. Let no man judge you how you're going to call what day a day. Today's the seventh day. No, yesterday's the seventh day. No, tomorrow's the seventh day. Today's January. No, it's March. Who cares? You can do it every one. It's not a sin anymore. And then he says, or of the Sabbath days. Uh-oh. Every time I read that to a Seventh-day Adventist, I hear a dun-dun-dun-dun going off in their brain like, whoops. Because what are they trying to do? They're trying to judge people by the Sabbath day. And Paul says, don't let anyone judge you by the Sabbath day. That baby is gone. That thing was nailed to the cross. It was blotted out. What was the purpose of the Sabbath day? Next verse tells us the answer. Which are a shadow of things to come. Um, I remember I was on a business trip one time. And the... I was in Chicago for a week on a business trip, and the final day of the of the training session, we finished a bit early, and so I rushed to the airport, and I found a flight that I could leave earlier, and so I could make it home a little bit earlier, a few hours earlier. And I did not tell my wife. I just took the early flight. I got on the flight. I went to the airport, and uh, I arrived there. I got in my car. I drove home. And my wife was expecting that I would be home in several more hours. But I got home early. Clever little guy that I am. And so I caught my wife and she was in the middle. She was in the arms of another man. Just kidding. She was doing laundry. And she saw me and she dropped her laundry. And she said, hey, you're home. And she hugged me. But what about my shadow? What about my shadow? And she says, oh, you're home. And she goes down to my shadow and she makes a little carving and etches the shadow and draws it and just loves my shadow. No. The Old Testament, the law, that was the shadow of Christ. How foolish it would be for us to see Christ crucified, risen, and coming again. And we say, hey, look, we have Jesus Christ. Let's go to his shadow and ignore the man. That's what we would be doing. If we were to go back to the Old Testament, to the ceremonial law, and say, let's celebrate the creation of the world on the seventh day Sabbath. Paul says, those are a shadow of things to come. That means it's a glimpse of something. It's, a, it's an outline. It's a profile. You ever, you ever see someone like in a dark room just kind of catch a glimpse of their profile? Right? Say, so, okay, their nose and kind of shit like that. I think I know who it is. When I turn the light on, I'll be sure. Or you can just see a shadow. And you can kind of say, that's a tall person. I recognize kind of his shadow. I can kind of make out some details of who it's going to be. That person, skinny person, tall, or their nose, or whatever. So you can say, I can see their shadow, but I can't quite see the person. But the shadow helps me to get an idea of the identity of that person. That's what the law was. That's what the ceremonial was. The 
ceremonial law. It gave us a glimpse, an outline, a shadowy figure. But what did Jesus Christ come? He turns the light on. No more shadow anymore. We know his age when he died. We know his name. We know how many siblings he had. We know the names of his family. We know his two of his stepbrothers, Jude and James. We know what his friends were, who his parents were. We know who the emperor of Rome was. We know who won his citizenship. We know the city he was born, where he was raised, where he fled to when he was under persecution. We know all these details. Why? Because we have the man himself. I don't get excited about the shadow when I have the person with me. I don't get excited about the ceremonial law that points to Christ when I can go directly to Christ. That's why I don't get excited about the seventh day Sabbath. It says, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. Where am I going to go when I get to heaven? What am I going to see with my own two eyes? I'm going to see the body which is of Christ. I'm going to see the body of Jesus Christ. I'm not going to care about the shadow. I'm not going to care about all the dietary laws or the clothing laws. I'm going to go directly to Jesus Christ. Here's what a Pharisee does. A Pharisee says, when Jesus Christ came, he said, hey guys, John the Baptist just told you this. I am offering to you the kingdom. The kingdom of heaven is here. The Messiah, it is me. I am here, the Son of God. And he proclaimed himself to the people. And what did all those people who could memorize the Pentateuch and they studied the Old Testament scriptures, which pointed them to Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ came and says, I'm here. The body which is of Christ, it's me. I'm here. And what did the Pharisees say? They said, don't bother us. We're busy studying what it's going to be like when the Messiah arrives. And Jesus says, he's arrived. I'm standing right in front of you. I'm talking to you. I and my Father are one. And they said, but we're too busy studying what the person is going to look like. They're too busy focusing on the Old Testament, on the ceremonial law. And they missed Christ. And today, people still do that. They say, we need to keep the Sabbath, we need to keep the dietary laws, we need to keep the clothing laws, we need to keep the plowing laws. And Jesus Christ and Paul here are saying, no you don't, we have Jesus Christ. So why do we worship on the first day of the week? Remember, it's because we are celebrating the creation of, not the world, but the creation of our salvation, the greatest creation. Why didn't they celebrate the creation of salvation in the Old Testament. Very simple. Why is it that they had a holy convocation, a holy assembly, on the seventh day and not the first day? Why did they not celebrate the creation of salvation? No, because it had not happened yet. They did not know what day of the week their salvation would be completed. It never happened yet. That's why they had the seventh day. All they could celebrate was the creation of the earth. Turn now to 1 Corinthians chapter 16. 1 Corinthians chapter 16. First Corinthians chapter 16, Paul is giving some commandments about a collection that he was going to bring to the saints in Jerusalem. And here in Corinth, they were going to take up an offering for these people in Jerusalem. They could not send it through Western Union, and they could not send it through um, Palawan or whatever it is. So Paul says, don't worry, I'll, me or someone else will take the money that's trustworthy and we will deliver it to the saints in Jerusalem. And so he says, now about this offering, I have, he has a few instructions about this offering. So it's organized. He says, now concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given order to the churches 
of Galatia, even so do ye. Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store, as God has prospered him, that there be no gatherings when I come. So Paul says, guys, when you meet together on the first day of the week for church service, not seventh day, when did they meet for church? On the first day, he says, when you guys meet together on the first day of the week, that would be Sunday, like today, he says, why don't you take your offerings then and lay it aside? Give it to the pastor there at the church in Corinth. And you keep it there in an offering box or whatever. And you keep it there and you just set it aside. And so when I come, if I come on a Tuesday or a Friday or a Saturday, that means I can, or someone else that, that is trustworthy, they can come and the offering for the saints in Jerusalem is already there. This way you don't need to have a special service, a gathering, a coming together when I arrive. It's already there, it's ready to go at a moment's notice. Someone can come, they can take an offering, and they can be gone, just like that. So when was it that they were together for that offering? What day of the week? First day of the week. Of course, because they're, they're in church on the first day of the week. Later, in the book of Revelation, chapter 1, John is saying, and I, John, was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. Uh, on the Lord's day. Lord Jesus Christ, on His day. So by that time, there had already been what we still call the Lord's Day today. You ever heard that? Today is the Lord's Day. It's Sunday. So the Lord's Day, Sunday, John in Revelation was already calling it the Lord's Day. Sabbath and Wednesday and Thursday and Monday and Tuesday, that's not the Lord's Day. The Lord's Day is a day in the week. And that's Sunday. It didn't say an I, John, was in the Spirit on the Sabbath day. That would be Saturday. Sabado. Sabbath. Sabado. But he said, I will, John, was in the spirit on the Lord's day, not the Sabbath day. So when is the Sabbath day? It's Saturday, the seventh day. God rested the seventh day. Sabbath means rest. When is the Lord's day? It's Sunday. It's upon the first day of the week. So some people will say, well, Seventh day Adventists will say, well, don't you know that Paul attended synagogues on the seventh day? Don't you know that Jesus attended the synagogue on the seventh day? And they're right. Physically, they did attend the Sabbath, the synagogue on the seventh day. But I'm going to give you some verses um, that talks about the attendance of Jesus and his disciples on the seventh day. Now, remember when Jesus... Or you might remember the story that Jesus went into the synagogue and he read a portion of the book from Isaiah. What they would do is they would read through the whole testament and they would pick out chronologically from Genesis to Malachi and they would pick out a portion and they would read through it chronologically every week. There's this chapter. They did not have chapters back then, but they would take a portion and they would set it and every week that they would read it. And when they would have a special guest, a visiting rabbi, or someone from the Sanhedrin, or a scribe would come, or a Pharisee would come, and they would ask that person, can you please do us the honor of reading this passage of scripture, and year after year after year, for decades, for centuries, they would be constantly going through the Old Testament over and over and over again. Jesus Christ went to the synagogue on the seventh day, the Sabbath, and his portion was about the Messiah in the book of Isaiah. And Jesus Christ opened it and he read the book, that passage that was allotted, that means appointed for that day. And he said, this day, this passage in the book of Isaiah is fulfilled. And they said, oh, isn't he nice? He's a good speaker. And Jesus says, let me be clear. I am the Messiah that this is talking about 
in the book of Isaiah. And you know what the people did after that? It says they picked up stones to kill him. What was Jesus doing there in the synagogue on the Sabbath day? Was he there to worship? Or was he there to evangelize? He was there to evangelize. Why? Because those were all a bunch of lost people sitting in that, in that uh, gathering on the Sabbath day. He was there to debate with them, to argue with them, to evangelize them. Here in church service, we are not to evangelize each other. I hope that after church today, I hope that uh, Jabez does not come and say, Hey, why don't you get saved? And try to evangelize him. And I'm not planning to try to evangelize Brother Jabez. Why? Because the church service is not for arguing and debating and evangelizing and converting the lost. It's for saved people to come and to worship God. But when Paul and Silas and Barnabas and Jesus went into the tabernacle or into, into the, um, on the Sabbath days, when they went into the synagogues, what were they doing? They were arguing and debating and fighting, trying to evangelize the lost people. They were not there to worship. Paul did not worship on the seventh day. He worshiped on the first day, Sunday. Jesus did not worship with his church on the seventh day in the synagogue. Jesus worshiped with his church on Sunday. He went into the synagogues, and Paul and Barnabas and Silas went into the synagogues on the seventh day. Why? To evangelize, to argue, to debate, not to worship. So, just because they went to the synagogues on the seventh day does not mean that they were attending church service on the seventh day. 1 Corinthians 16, we just read it, is clear. The church met on the Lord's day, the first day of the week. So we see that the seventh day Sabbath is part of the ceremonial law. It's part of the thing that points us to Jesus Christ. It's a shadow of things to come. It was blotted out. It was nailed to the cross. It is gone. There's no Sabbath breakers mentioned in the New Testament. There's no person that was condemned for breaking the Sabbath in the New Testament. And before Exodus chapter 20, there's no mention of any Sabbath breaking, Sabbath keeping, Sabbath commandment, nothing about the Sabbath before Exodus chapter 20. That was a shadow, things to come. But the body is Christ. Before we close, I want to give you one last point. I used to have a weekly Bible study with um, a group of Seventh-day Adventists. And uh, back before I was married, my fiancé at the time would come and translate for me a few times. And um, we would go over these verses. Now, what about this? It says, they, you know, we're in the synagogue. And what about the Sabbath day? Remember the Sabbath day. Keep it holy. You're forgetting the Sabbath. No, I'm not forgetting the Sabbath. I just don't care about the Sabbath. I care about Christ. The body is a Christ. They finally said, you know what? The Seventh-day Sabbath thing? It's wrong. And here's what convinced them. It was this point right here. Does Jesus ever tell someone to commit fornication? Does God ever say, hey, why don't you go to and commit fornication? Does he ever do that? No. Does he ever say, I want you to go and envy or covet, or commit idolatry, or take my name in vain, or steal, or lie, or commit murder. Does God ever once ever command anyone anywhere, Old Testament, New Testament, today, ever, or ever will, or ever has, or is now, to break a moral commandment? Never. He never would. That would go against his nature. God will never tell you to sin. He will never tell you to break a moral law. So if God told you to break, if God told you, let's say your name was Peter, and you had a vision of a bunch of unclean animals, and it was a moral law that you should not eat unclean animals, would God ever say, Arise, Peter, kill and eat? No, not if it's a moral commandment. 
God will never tell you to break a moral commandment. But does God tell people to break a ceremonial commandment? Like, it's okay to wear clothing made of mixed materials. Yes, God will say, break ceremonial commandment, go ahead, it's not moral. God will never, ever tell anyone to violate a moral commandment. That would be a sin and go against his nature. God does not sin. God does not command you to ever sin. Well, what if they get saved by me sinning? Don't sin. Don't do it. No matter what you think will be accomplished for God, don't sin. But if you look at the Old Testament, what were they doing on the Sabbath day? They were in the tabernacle, then later in the temples. And what were they doing? They were having a holy convocation. It means they had a, a gathering together, kind of like what we're doing now. And so someone had to get up and preach and speak. And he had to make a living. He had to work. Your pastor, our pastor, he works on Sundays. He's the pastor. Who do you think made the sacrifices on the Sabbath, Sabbath day? Oh yeah, the Levites did. The Levites, they worked the Sabbath day. Why? Because God commanded them to do it. What about the priests? Yeah, they worked on the Sabbath day. What about the singers? They worked on the Sabbath day. Why? Because God said so. Uh, God told them, I want you to break my commandment about the Sabbath. And you know what they did? They said, of course, God is just a ceremonial. Sure. Every single Sabbath day, the priests violated the Sabbath. The Levites violated the Sabbath. The high priest violated the Sabbath. Singers violated the Sabbath. The one who led the Holy Convocation violated the Sabbath. And God would never tell anyone to violate the moral so what do we do with the seventh day? It was written in the finger of God. Well, actually, that got destroyed, and Moses had to do his own finger for the next one. It's in the Ten Commandments, which is in the Ark of the Covenant. Now, the Ark of the Covenant is gone. We don't know where it's at. Probably gone forever. So that doesn't mean anything. Well, it's, you know, it says to remember the Sabbath day. Yeah, they should have remembered it right up until Christ was nailed to the cross. What do we have to do with the seventh day Sabbath? About as much as we have to do with the ceremonial law of wearing mixed clothing or plowing with an ox and a donkey. We have nothing to do with it. It was a pointer in the direction and it points to the body of Christ. It was nailed to the cross, has been fulfilled, has been plotted out, and it is gone. Just for a fun game, just for a little fun, if you ever meet a Seventh day Adventist, Ask them, do you keep the Sabbath? And they say, yes, of course, I'm not a Sabbath breaker. They say, that's the mark of the beast. Then say, okay, the Bible says to never kindle a fire, never to make a fire on the Sabbath day. How do you get to church? I've never had one who could get around uh, a tricycle. Well, guess what you're burning when you're in that tricycle? Gasoline. <laughs> guess what happens when you take gasoline and you put it inside a motorcycle? A fire. Sorry, but you can't get to church. You're kindling a fire on the Sabbath day. They're breaking their own Sabbath. Who today really keeps the Sabbath? Not even the Seventh-day Adventists. Not even the Jews. 